Hi everyone, um, thanks for coming to my talk. Uh, it seems quite a surprisingly busy room. So, um, okay, can I just get a bit of a show of hands to start with? Uh, who's, a, who's a Scala developer here? That's good. Okay. Who's not a Scala developer? Who's never seen Scala code in their life? Right. Okay, so this is going to be quite involved with code. So hopefully you can follow along. There's plenty of um, kind of functional ideas that we can take away from this. Um, I'm in the Scala REPL right now. Everything we're going to be doing is code. I don't have any slides. Um, yeah, I came, I came across this plugin last week called REPL Resent. I don't know if anyone heard of that. Um, so, so I'm trying that out. So if this goes wrong, um, that, yeah, there's no talk. Um, okay, so like I said, um, so it's called a purely functional approach to building large applications. Okay, and in, uh, in the 45 minutes I've got, um, we're not going to build a large application, but we're going to make a little bit of one maybe, and then we can, can maybe see how that would apply to, to larger applications. Okay, so like I said, every, everything I do here is going to be in the REPL. So the first thing I want to do is I want to bring in another library in, um, the Scala Z library. Are people familiar with that? Yeah, yeah, people use it, people scared of it. Yep. Okay, all right, we'll, we'll be using that quite a bit today. So just to prove I'm not lying, like I said, everything I, I've written here, we're, we're going to run as well. So this is actually going to be a re real thing. So we're going to Im import Scala Z. And then, you're probably quite familiar as well, we'll bring in a few, a few other imports. So we're going to be dealing with futures. Um, so so the, these imports are generally what we use for, for playing around and evaluating futures, particularly in REPL. Okay, so I'm going to introduce you to a couple of functions that have been provided to us by someone else. Um, that we can effectively treat it as a black box. Um, we know, we know this is what we want to use, but we, we don't really have much access to it. We can't change these. We can't do anything else with it. All we can do is call it. So the first one is in this object called Twitter. And we get a new method here called getTweets. And we've got uh, some, some parameters we can pass. So the name, so that'd be like the, the Twitter handle of, of whoever we, we want to uh, get the tweets for. And then, you know, an API key in secret, you know, it's kind of... Standard stuff for, for getting, getting stuff over, over HTTP. And this produces a list of tweets, and it completes asynchronously, so it completes in the future. I've also just provided here um, just, just the types that we'll, we'll be using, so a tweet which is made up of the actual user who said it and then what they said. Okay, so once we've got this, is this okay at the back? Is this all legible and everything okay? Yep. Okay, so once we've got this, we, we, can, we can then call, call, the, call this uh, method, um, given, say, Twitter handle, and then an API key and an API secret. Naturally, this completes in the future, so we have to block on the result, and then we can just inspect exactly what we get here. So we run that, and then we can see these are some of my most recent tweets. Okay? So what I thought we could do is... I thought it would be interesting, and uh, there's a few of these Twitter bots you see on the internet which take someone's input and then ju like jumble it all up and then produce some, some new text that kind of looks like what they said, but it, it's all a bit weird. Have you seen those before? They're called e-books sometimes, like horse e-books and recruiter e-books and things like that. No? Okay, well, generally they're called Markov chains. So what tends to happen is you get a dictionary of some text, that text is analyzed, and then that produces new, new text. So what we've got here is this method called generate string, which takes our string, which is going to be our dictionary, and then this value here called context. And so what this is, this is effectively going to be how, how far we look in our dictionary when we're creating new strings. So I probably haven't explained that the best, but say, say we had the string, I don't know, my name is Noel, my name is Christmas in French. So then, when it comes to generating a new string, if we had a look ahead of, say, two, and then we saw name is, from the original dictionary, 50% of the time, the next word is null, and then 50% of the time, the next word is Christmas. So we've got this kind of weighted average here, and then we can then produce some, some random, random data that it kind of looks like I said it, maybe, or it might just be a bit weird. 
Okay, so again, this is another um, uh, another API that's provided to us. We can't change this. This is what we need to deal with. Okay, so if we want to plug these together, um, you know, we're, we're in the REPL here, so we, we can we can probably not do things as cleanly as we would. So we can take this um, this function that I wrote on the previous slide. We can block on the result of that because that was a future, and then when we get our list of tweets. We can then manipulate these into a string and then call our generate string method and, and maybe get some funny results. So here's our two methods. And then when we call random string, we get just weird stuff that kind of I might have said, or perhaps it's just a bit of a weird insight into my thoughts. Um, yeah. Okay, so what we've got here is. We've not we've not done this in the most idiomatic way, really. You know, we've we've blocked on futures. You know, we've we've kind of hard coded everything in together. Um, let's see let's see if we can make this a bit nicer. So, because we're dealing with futures, um, we can effectively treat these as um, like monadic sequences and, and bind on the results and then produce a single future at the end. So this could be a particular implementation of that. So. We'll call get tweets and we'll bind that result when it completes to this, this value here. We will then manipulate that from a list of tweets into just a string. And then we can pass that string to our generator, which, you know, we don't know. It might be an online service that's really smart or it might just be local and take a while to process. We bind the result of that to R and that's what we return. And then here as well, I've just, I've just moved the, the configuration we had off to the side. So the things we needed to make this run was, you know, the API key and secret that Twitter would need. And then I've said here that when we're generating these chains, only ever look, at, look in, in pairs of two words. So if this context was like six, we'd get six words. And then the chances of finding deviations in the text I've written would probably be quite small. So this, this then produces the same results as we saw before. Given, given a, a, a Twitter handle, and we block on the results, we're just going to get results again. And yeah, some, sometimes sometimes some funny stuff comes out. Uh, yeah. OK, so what I thought we could do is, is try and extract this configuration. Because right now, it, it's still hard coded. It's still in our source. If we wanted to change this, or if we had different environments, then we, you know, we, we, need to, we need to be hard coding this in right now. So what I thought we could do is, is maybe separate this into some, some slightly different thing, a, a kind of a, like a, a configuration object. But before we look at that, I just want to take a sidestep and just have a bit of an explore of functions. Um, and there, there shouldn't really be much surprising here. Okay, so we've got, we've got a, a pair of functions. One that, that takes a string and returns an integer. Well, it takes an integer and returns a boolean, and these pretty much do exactly what they say on the tip. You know, it's functional programming. So what we can now do is we, we can compose these together. So we could, we can make a function say called is even length string, and that would be take a string length, get the result of that, and then map that result into another value. So using this is even, and I'm just going to make a sweeping statement here, and I'm going to make a couple of these. Um, yeah. And um, what we can say is that we can actually treat functions as functors. So these are effectively things that are mappable. So we can effectively take the result of that first function and then apply another function on it and map that result. And these, these two functions that I've written here, they, you know, these do the same thing. And um, th there shouldn't really be any surprise as to, as to how this works. OK? So then, like I said, we're, we're, we're going to create this, this config object. And it's just, just a nice place where we can collate the information that we need. And then what we can do is we can provide a pair of functions here. So we can have a function, say, just to grab the key from our config. Given a config, that gives us the key. For this example, you know, we're just working with strings. But I imagine in a, in a more, more proper application, this would probably be its own type. Um, but then, given any old config we have in the world, we can then get those values. So then, you can probably start to see now how, how you would 
would, would wire up a method to a function called key in secret. Given a config, it returns a pair. The first one is the key, the second one is the secret. So this is pretty, you know, th th there's, no, there's no surprises here. This is nothing new, hopefully. Um, so we can have this function here where we create a new function and then that takes a config and then we pass that into each of the functions as a tuple and we get what we want. So then we can then um, provide configuration in, in, into our function and that just works as, as we'd expect. But I didn't run it here, so there we go. Okay, you know, there's, there's nothing surprising. So what we've done, we've successfully extracted the config, we're good to go, that's great. But let's just, have, let's just before we move on, let's just have another think and see if there's a slightly better way we can do this. So like I said, we, functions are, are mappable in essence, but then they're also flat mappable as well. And so we can treat functions as monads. And what, what we're saying here is that given a function, we can bind onto the result of that function, and then we can take another function and apply that function if we need to, and then bind on the result of that, and then yield our response. So this is quite a trivial example, and you can imagine we could build this up from lots of functions that take a config and return something, and then we can bind on those results and then yield something at the end. And notice here, this is, this is not a, an explicitly brand new function I've created here. I've just used the fact that these are functions in order to create a, a, a more grand function. And th this, this almost builds on what Runa was saying earlier, is that we can deal with these smaller, smaller constructs and then we can plug them together appropriately. And as long as we can reason about all the single parts, we can reason about the thing as a whole. And so these two... These two implementations I've shown are, are basically the same thing. All okay so far? Yeah? Okay? So, let, let, let's see what we can do with this. So, I've, ra I've wrapped our two functions we have here into new functions. So, we've pulled the configuration out and we're saying, well, all we really want to do, when we want to get tweaks, all we really care about is the username. That's all we do. We don't want to care in our application that the API key is correct and the API secret is correct. That's all part of the config of the app, and if that changes, it shouldn't have too much an effect on the way the application works. So we'll extract that out, and then we'll provide a function that returns a function that, given a config, gives us what we want. So we've got a config here, returns our list of tweets asynchronously. Given that config, this returns a generated string eventually. So, just a reminder, the, these, are, these are our signatures here. So then we can then provide an implementation of this using flat map. And this might be one way you'd, you'd write this. So using the for comprehension, we could then call get tweets and bind on the result. So what would the result be in this case? Well, it's not actually a list of tweets. It's a, a future of a list of tweets. So we're kind of back where we started at the, at, at the start of this little exploration in that we would then have to, say, block on, uh, on the result of, of, of this, and then that would then give us our list of tweets, and then we could um, do what we need to do to make that into a string, and then call generate string. So we're, we're not really that much better off right now. Um, even though we've, we've got the, the configuration extracted. So let's just take a step back a sec and see if there's anything else we can do here. So from before, we had these two functions. Um, nothing, nothing's changed. But what I suggest we could do is we could wrap these in a slightly different type. And that type's called a reader. And all, all I've done here, this is provided by ScalaZ. And then all I've done here is wrapped the function in this reader construct. And then the type that results from that is a reader of config to string. So the, the, uh, the first type is the, the input to our function, and the second type is what's returned from our function. So I'll tell you now for free that, that a reader is a monad as well. But then also, it, it also gives us this, this function here, run, which then when we pass in 
the given type, it then goes and executes whatever that function is inside the reader. So we can see here that this then, no, sorry. Um, this then works here as, as we'd expect. So as before, we can treat reader as a monad. So we can use flat map or a four comprehension and we can build over this. And look, this is, this is the same code as before, except that we're dealing with different types now. So rather than functions earlier, which was, which was a really nice convenience that we, we could use functions, uh, now, now we've got this other thing called a reader. And then again, we can, we can ex um, create this, and then we can call run with our config, and then it just works as it did before. Does this all make sense so far? Yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so... Again, we, we've, not, we've not really made much progress here. All, all I've done is actually provided a, another level of indirection. You know, we've still got this problem that we're dealing with where the, the kind of futures are getting in the way. So the nice thing about the reader monad is that it provides a monad transformer as well. And then we'll come on to that exactly in a second. But I just thought we'd take a little aside just to have a very, very brief explore of what monad transformers are. So, for those not familiar, if we have kind of stacked monads here, so we've got a future of an option of something, and then if we want to work with that something, Scala Z provides us with a new type called an option T. And then we can wrap our future of option of something inside an option T, and then we can then almost just pretend that that future isn't there. So it's almost like we're dealing with an option here again. So we can call map, and then the function we provide will then work on the value in the future of that option. And then the nice thing as well is, is that this then also respects the way options work. So if it's a future of none when it eventually completes, then this map will do nothing. So, again, notice here that when we're at this point, we're actually not, not with our future of option of something anymore. We're with a brand new type. And so we need to then flip back to our future of option with our run method, which is provided on option T. And then we can just work on this as usual. And you can see here that we started off with a sum of one. When that completed, we wanted to add nine to it. And then when we extracted the result, we can see that was the same. So this functionality here is specific for options because this is an option T, an option transformer. Uh, and, and so the same thing is, is here for, for the reader monad as well. So just as earlier when we had uh, a future of an option of something, if we had a reader of a future of something, we can abstract over that future or any monad in general. So it could be a reader which eventually returns an option of something, and then we could abstract over that option, much like we did with the option T on the previous slide, and then just work with it as, 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 you, as normal. So to use the reader T, let's say we had a function here. So takes a string and returns a future of an integer. Really, really, really simple function. And then I'm going to say another sweeping statement here um, is that this function here works in exactly the same way as that reader construct did a minute ago. So this expects to take a, a single argument function which returns a monad of something. So in this case, it's going to take a string and return a future event. And then we, we'll just help the compiler along, but it can usually work this out itself. And then this is the type of that, that value here. So in a way, we've kind of like extracted everything that was getting in the way from our, from our things earlier. So in this case, our, our input is a string, and then this all happens in a future and, and returns an integer. And just like the option T, that's a monad itself. I haven't actually demonstrated here. Maybe, maybe I should. But um, 
we could then run map or flat map or, or anything similar, monadic or, or stack other ones of these up. And then when we call run with our string input, those functions all get called and the input comes out of the other end, all wrapped inside the, the monad that we were abstracting over. Okay? So now, now that we have this, we can, we can input a string and call run, and then as soon as that future completes, we get the value, and that, that is 11 characters long. Okay, so back to what we were doing earlier. Hi, good question there. On the, on the what, sorry? On the place Yeah, sure. Um, okay, so uh, you're going to stretch me now. So this comes from the term Kleisley arrow, which is effectively just a fancy way in category theory of saying a morphism between two categories. So it's just a function, effectively. And we, we can think of it as a function, as going from one domain, so we're in our string, in this case, into a future of integers. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah, and um, the reason for this import, this is, this is inside the Scala Z pro, um, package, but it, it's not an explicit import. So um, earlier, um, when we did this, this, this pulls in lots of types, but it doesn't actually pull in um, Kleisley, and there's a few, I, I think even some of the option T stuff, it, it doesn't pull in as well. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah? okay. So, back to, back to where we were. So we had our example from earlier, and this, this is what we, we'd come up with. So we wanted a function, given some config, goes and computes our result. But then we worked out that this, this wasn't great. This, this, was, this was getting in the way slightly. So taking what I've just explained about readers and reader t's, we, we could use reader t's in this case here. And I think it would look something like this. So... We have this Kleisley construct, which takes a config, and then we can just call the config here. And then this returns a reader t of this type here. So we take our config, and it's going to return a future of a list of tweets. But we've separated these out now, so we don't need to worry about it completing in the future while we're working with it. And we don't really care about the config. We just know that at some point when this gets run, in order to run this, we need a config. And so we can just say, right, well, here's the function you need to do, but when you get your config, how to run it. Okay? And then, very, you know, the, the same thing here for, for generating our string. We have a, a function here. Given the config, we'll then go and do it. All good? No. I did this earlier as well. Sorry. That imports on a slide. I, I end up not running. Um, so there we go. So now, now we can have another go. Where we got blocked earlier, when, when the future was getting in the way, we can have another go now that we're dealing with reader t's. And I think the function would look something like this. So the reader t is a monad. And so when we call get tweets, we bind onto the result of that. So that would be a list of tweets. We then massage that information into the representation we need in order to pass into get string, and then we bind on the result of that, and that's what we end up returning. So one thing to note here is when, when this function gets called, we don't go and run it. All we've done here is effectively created a little script, and all we're really saying is, when I give you some config, this is what you go and need to go and do. Okay? And just, just while this is on the slide as well, just, just try and recognize the, the code I've written here because I think we'll be seeing this a little bit and again. And in fact, we've already seen it already. We saw it here. And look, this code is very similar. But this, this was when we were wire, wiring config in automatically. So yeah, just, just, just keep an eye on this code and we'll see how this changes as, as the rest of the talk goes on. So then... We can, we can stack this up for a particular user. So we can call it for me, and then we can call run with some config. And then 
when we then call this function, it's going to do just like we did before, except now our config is out of the way, and now we don't even care about the futures. Does this all make sense so far? Yep. Okay. So we're kind of done here, really. We've, we've, we've written our application. Um, I've proved that it works because I run it, so we're good to ship this and, and go home. But maybe, maybe we should just have a little thing about if we can make this testable. So I think one thing we could do in order to write some tests would be something like this. And I must apologize, just with this presentation system, the code tends to get quite busy. I think if you wrote this in your day job, you'd probably have longer lines and things like that. But all I've done here is we're working with the same function. And I've got a pair of parameter lists now. And I've, I've, I, I, I've parameterized the two functions that we needed to call. So I'll call to Twitter, and then I'll call to our chain generator. And then I'm just going to inject these when I need them. And so in our production code, we would then put in the, these concrete examples, say, go off to Twitter and call it, and go to my generator and call that. And then we, we can wire this up with whatever implementation we want. So if we wanted to, say, provide something like a mock or something that we've written ourselves, we could go and do that. And th this, this starts to tie in. I don't know if people saw Lars's talk yesterday on functional mocking. Uh, this is the same thing. You know, this is nothing Scala-specific. This is nothing Scala-Z-specific. This is purely using functions as parameters. We've got higher-order functions here. And look, this code here, it hasn't, it hasn't even changed. And so the question then is, what are, what are we going to do to test this? And I thought what we could do is use ScalaCheck. People familiar with ScalaCheck? Use it? Yeah, yeah, okay. So let's, let's bring ScalaCheck in. That's all we're going to need for today. And then for those who are not familiar with ScalaCheck, what, what we do is we're going to specify properties about our code. And then we're going to say, for all the input that you can provide, I assert that this thing will always be true. And then we leave it up to the framework to, to then provide that input. So what we need to do is we need to tell ScalaCheck how to create a list of tweets. Because it, it doesn't know. It, you know that, that's code we've written. We know what's a valid tweet and what's not and things like that. And generally what you do with ScalaCheck is you then have a, a little implicit where um, you say, here's how you generate arbitrary list of tweets. And then when, it, when, when your property is called, it then creates an arbitrary tweet for you and puts it in, into your code. Uh, but rather, rather than, than doing all that ourselves, there's a library here called Shapeless Contrib. And this, this provides a neat way in order to provide arbitrary case classes for us. So just to save reams and reams of, of code, we can just pull this one import in. And then the compiler knows how to then go and create lists of tweets for us. That's another sweeping statement, and uh, I can provide more information about that later. But that's all we need to do for now. And again, we've got another wall of code coming up. Okay. And this is what I think an interesting property could be. So we're writing a property here, and then we're saying, for all these tweets, whatever you provide, I reckon that this Boolean expression here will hold. And so let's, let's kind of just break this down a little bit. Well, let's start here. This is our RAND string that we've been, we've been writing as we go along. And we've got a couple of functions here and then a name of, of, of the, the user we want to, uh, to, to provide to, to get tweets for. And then I think all we really need to do for this test is make sure that the list of tweets that were given to us by our Twitter service that we use all of those in order to provide our chain generation. So that's all that code did, really. It called a function, it then massaged it into a string, and then called another function with that string. So I think all we need to do is whatever the tweets we're given, we don't need to do anything with them. So I've created a, a reader t here, just using this Kleisley construct again, 
We don't care about the config in this case, and we don't even care that it returns in the future, but obviously it needs to return in the future, so we'll just wrap this in the future and move on. Same here, same deal, we're just passing the information through. And then when we call this, we want to make sure that all our tweets are then part of the generated string. And so I think that's what this code here says. It says, for all the tweets, make sure that the received text contains the content of that. Does that make sense? Yep. Okay. And then we can run that and, and let Scala check just do what it needs to do. So we can see that, that the property that we've decided holds in this case. So, Alexa, I apologize for this earlier because this is a big wall of code. So, just wondering if there's anything we can do to, to make this better. So, what we had earlier was th this little for comprehension. And for those of you familiar with Scala or Haskell and Monads in general, the code we had on the screen, it, it didn't actually make use of um, the, the reader T itself. All we were doing was calling get tweets massaging the data and calling generate string. There was nothing in our code actually about the reader. Like that, that was definitely, definitely needed, but it wasn't actually part of what we were testing. So what we could do is we can just provide an abstraction over that monad completely. And then we can say actually, so this is what we had. You see here, that there's nothing here to do with readers apart from the fact that we're passing readers in and getting a reader out. So what we can do is we could just provide an abstraction over this and have something like this. And we say, well, we know we're going to be working with a monad because we know we're in a for comprehension. So as long as the function you provide takes a string and returns an M of list of tweets and our generate text returns an M of a string, then we can pretty much guarantee that the whole thing will will work in that same monad as well. And look, this code still hasn't changed. So I think the thing to point out here is that all these M's must be the same. So we could provide a function here that goes a string to an option of a list of tweet, and then as long as this was a string to an option of string, then we would end up with an optional string coming out of the other end. That might be an interesting implementation. Or the M's could be futures, or parsers or any other monads you can think of yourself. So now that we've said that we don't actually care about the reader T, we can end up writing our test like this. And I think we're testing the same thing here. So I'm using the ID monad. And if you're not familiar with that, that, that provides all the laws and properties of monads, but it has no side effects or any secondary effects at all. So, and also in Scala is that th this, this is just a type alias to, to the value inside, so you can almost ignore it's there. So I have annotated it on these types, but I've not had to wrap this in some kind of ID constructor, which you would have to do in, in Haskell. And here, we're still calling ram string, but then... There's no reader T anymore. It, things are coming out of the other end. There's an ID of string because we're passing in IDs of something. And then again, this test will just work as it did before. Okay? So that's great. So now we know our code works and we've got tests to prove it. So we really can just ship it and go to the beach and, and we're done. But then, of course, pointy head boss comes along and says, actually, there's a new feature we need here. We need to put some logging in because people are not sure that the, 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 the output they're getting is correct. So what we could do here is we, we've got some, some log framework somewhere out there, provides a function like this, given some input, it's going to complete eventually. Okay? And so we, are, we go off and we write our logging implementation. We use reader T's. We, we maybe change our config as well in order to, I don't know, provide uh, the, the, the server that the logger needs to write to or the log level or, or whatever, things like that. But then we still need to update our RAND string function, which is where the actual logging is going to take place. 
And so I think it could look something like this. So we need a new function here. So that's logging string to m of unit. You know, like, like that previous slide showed, it's going to be a future of unit in production. But maybe when we're testing this, we don't care that it completes in the future. We can mock out or provide a secondary function that does this for us. And then you can see here, I've put in a couple of lines of where the logging actually happens. OK? So then, I think now, I think our, I think our testing parameters have slightly changed. Because what we've got now is, in, in our previous test, we, we, we just assumed or implied that the, these, these two functions would get called. And we could do that because we wanted to make sure that the code in between those got used. And so kind of by deduction, we could assume that those two methods were called. But now, now that we've got something that returns unit, if we want to verify that that gets called, we, we can't use ID anymore, especially if we want to be stateless. You know, we could write a function here returns ID of unit that sets a var somewhere, and then we're good to go. But we're all really smart functional programmers who don't believe in shared mutable state. So what we could do is, because we've provided an abstraction over our monad, and in production and in our integration tests, we're going to be using reader T's. And as we've seen already, we use a different monad in our test. We can use a, another monad as well. And I think an interesting one to use here would be a writer. And again, I'm sorry for a big wall of text. And I've, I've had to provide a type alias just to make things fit on the screen. So we could use a writer. And then for those not familiar with a writer, um, whenever, whenever we, we call something with a writer, we, we can almost do like a secondary call somewhere and say, write this as well and write this. And then when we call run, we then get almost like a little log or a little register of what was written. Um, this parameter here, uh, in this case, I've used a map for a string of int. This can be any monoid. Are people comfortable with what a monoid is? So it's this, we can append to things, and then what comes out the other end is everything appended together. So when we call our tweets function, we want to say that we've called tweets once. And then when we call this, we want to say that we've called our generate text function once. And then when we call log, every time we call log, we want to say that we've run that once. Notice here, this calls set because we want to return this value as a string. But because this is unit, there's a handy function called tell. OK, so now we can run this test, and we can verify that, that everything we've said works. It's like, no, OK. So, we actually have a bug in our test here. Can anyone, anyone spot what that was? No? In a previous implementation, we actually called log twice. And we've said we only call it once here. So if we change this, we can then run our tests and everything works. So what we've got here is a nice, is a nice test that ensures that we call our logging twice. And that was the only effect that that had there. Again, I've kind of rushed through this a little bit because I just wanted to kind of show the, the principles behind this rather than going into the implementation that when we call run, this actually returns a tuple and we're only looking at what was written and not the result, but I just kind of wanted to show what we could do here. So that's about all I had time for and all I, I really wanted to show. So I thought it'd just be interesting to kind of recap what, what we've actually looked at here. So we were given some unhel unhelpful APIs. You know, we had very little control over those. You know, when we called this Twitter um, function, we, we, we couldn't really work with it in any other way. Um, so you know, this, this could have been something else. This could be like going off and making a credit card purchase. Or maybe it is calling Twitter, and we've only got a certain number of API calls we're allowed to make. And so that, that could then have an effect on, on, on how, how we tested it. And so using the using the constraint that we had to work with these APIs, we found a really nice way in order to provide different configuration for our code using these reader and reader team monads, which are just glorified functions. And then we found a nice way using out-of-the-box tools in order to make this integration really easy and really testable. 
You know, these two APIs didn't know anything about each other, and now we've provided a way to wire these together in a way that we can be sure works, and we're quite sure that we can test this in an easy way without having to go off to third parties or create long-running brittle integration tests. And then we've done this really just using some powerful libraries that, that are really, really useful in day-to-day in -day develop, development. So we've got ScholarZ, and we use some ScholarCheck at the end, and a very, very small amount of Shapeless just, just to make, make the creation of our tests really, really nice and um, succinct. Um, so yeah, that's about all I had time for. Um, thank you. If you have any questions, uh, I'd be happy to, to go through them. Thanks. Well, you put those slides on GitHub. Yes, yes, definitely. I was mind blowing, but a little bit overwhelmed. Okay, I, I, yeah, I was worried about that. Yeah, I, I definitely will. Um, and I'll, I'll put the right hashtags on and, and all that. Hi. Yeah, Thank you. Thanks. Hi. So, uh, if you have an abstraction of a mona, can you, uh, using Scala Z, somehow, somehow combine a future mona with an option mona with a reader mona so you can pass just this combined? Monad? Yeah, so, so we can use monad transformers. Um, so. Uh, so then you won't need this uh, option P monad, right? If you could combine option monad with future monad, then. Um, I think you'd have to do that yourself. Generally, this is the, the traditional way to do that. So you can stack those up. But, but this is a monad in itself. So you could then stack a reader on top of that. And then, you know, a writer monad on top of that or whatever. And, you know, good, good luck trying to work out exactly the, the dimensions you're going through there. But, um, yeah, gen generally for stacking monads, um, that doesn't actually come for free with functional programming because monads don't compose uh, in a general way. But they do in specific ways. So a lot of monads have a transformer attached to them as well. Option T, we saw writer, there's a writer T, reader T. Um, but things like futures, I don't think, generally have a transformer because you need to block to get the result from that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. No. Oh.